Hey, welcome to The Protectors. Kyle Mills is on the show today, and I just realized, actually, he helped me realize that today is his pub day, September 15th. So uh, welcome to the show, Kyle. How are you? I'm great. The pub day is always nice. You know, I'm working an, an entire year in your basement, and finally, this is the day something comes of it. What are pub days like? I mean, you've authored numerous books, New York Times bestsellers, uh, Abound. Um, what makes this pub day different? Obviously COVID's making it different, but now you're <laughs> jumping into a new series and everything else. What's different about this pub day? Well, mostly it's the COVID thing. So usually I'm on planes pretty much every day going from one place to another. And, uh, I usually started off in the twin cities. So I've usually been there for a couple of days doing, doing, uh, events and, and, uh, getting ready for the scent, you know, to send the book off. But, uh, this year, yeah, I'm in my basement in, uh, in Wyoming. So I got to stay home, which I, it's, it's kind of relaxing. I have to say it's, it's been, a, it's been a little crazy last year. I was living in Spain, so I had to fly to the United States from Spain. And then I think I had, you know, a different town every day for two weeks. So, um, I can't complain. Now, COVID has is definitely put a, a different spin on pub days. And, you know, we're a bunch of months into it. And I've interviewed a lot of authors that, you know, they miss some really big publications, especially their premier books coming out in the beginning. Mm -hmm. This one's different because at least now, you know, we've had a few months to get used to doing these types of interviews. Um, how do you, what do you like, what do you think about these these remote broadcast Zoom slash StreamYard slash interviews? I like them. You know, I did my first event last night. So, you know, a bunch of people came and they asked questions and you got the little chat thing on the side. And I did it with Brad Thor. He, he came and asked questions and we did an interview thing and uh, it was a lot of fun. So I've done a couple of them now, I guess. Actually, I did two yet last night. And it's nice because some people that maybe couldn't get to the venues before um, or that I couldn't get anywhere close to them can show up and uh, hang out and chat and ask questions. Whereas, you know, you don't want to maybe drive seven hours to, to get to the bookstore that I'm at. Yeah, you do have unprecedented access to authors and to the writing community, which is great. Uh, one thing about the protectors is I've interviewed tons of people within a community and a lot of great authors, including yourself. And I always like asking for advice because a lot of people within the veteran LEO or in this community want to write books. The process is obviously different now that, that COVID's here and a lot of it has to be done. There's not a lot of like on-site research being done. How has your writing process changed with, with the implementation of COVID precautions? This one hasn't been too bad because I wrote this book primarily prior to COVID. So the next one though, that I'm one that I'm working on now, one of the main things is, you know, settings have to pretty much all be places I've already been. So I can't really go somewhere. Um, even in the last book, to some extent that was that way uh, toward the end. But um, that would probably be my biggest, the biggest change is that I'm sort of stuck here. So Everywhere you read about, every location you read about, uh, in the next book, a bunch of it takes place in parts of Africa where I used to live. And uh, so I know them really well. And that, you know, that brings up a good point. You are going to, you've just, is it been recently you picked up the next three issues or not issues, but next three novels of Mitch Rapp? Yeah, I've signed on for another three. So I've done six of the Rapp books and now I'll do another three. What was it like jumping into the character head of Mitch Rapp? You know, he's a well-established character and then taking over the realms of that. I, you know, in a way it was, it wasn't too difficult because that was such a rich character um, already when I took it over. I mean, a lot of books had already been written. We'd already, we'd known, and I'd been a fan of the series, so I already knew Mitch and I'd known him from when he was in college to when he was in his mid forties. Uh, you know, I knew everything about his career and, you know, his wife and his, 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 the girls he dated and all this stuff. So his friends. So 
you had a guy that felt very real to me, um, as opposed to a character that I might create where I have to create him from the whole cloth. You know, I've got nothing to start with. So it was a continuation of where Vince had already taken that character. Now, total power is a topic, you know, it's the loss of the power grid. It's something I, this is something I've been looking forward to. I believe one of the main books I had in the back was, was it two seconds later or two seconds after or something like that was when, you know, when EMP hits. Same type <laughs> right. of premise, but this is different. What's your take on that? And if you could be anywhere, okay, everybody, that's not at, if you know what total power is about, it's going to be about the losing the power grid. So the question I have is, where would you want to end up if the power went out? And you can't say Wyoming, because <laughs> that's, I'm sure that'd be a great place to hunker down. Uh, you know, I, I thought about it a lot as the, you know, <clears throat> I consider myself pretty self-sufficient. I spent most of my adult life in the back country and, you know, some of the harshest climates in the world. Um, but a lot of it does come down to where are you? How lucky are you? as to where you are. So I'm not too bad off in Wyoming. I have a river that's, you know, a hundred feet away. You can drink out of and, you know, elk wander around my backyard. So I would shoot one. Um, and there aren't very many people here to compete with, but it gets really cold. You know? So, um, I don't know, maybe a remote part of Hawaii would be a good spot to be in because the climate, you don't really need heating and air conditioning. You can grow stuff there year round. You also have fishing, uh, which you know, a lot of, as they say, there are a lot of fish in the sea. So even if everybody was fishing, it wouldn't be too bad. Um, that might be your best bet for survival. I like that. I like that. Most of the time people are always, they, they try to think of like the Florida's or the Texas or somewhere, but no. Texas barren Florida is just, it's Florida. Yeah. I, I mean, you have to, that. and you can't be near any people, you know, cause yeah. then you're going to have to compete. You can't, you have mm -hmm. to have access to water because when the power goes out, most people don't know this, but in a couple of weeks, the backups go yeah. out and water stops being pumped to your house. Um, so you got no sanitation, nothing to drink. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have to think about all these things. What was, what'd you do to, uh, research this? Obviously you, you know, you did a lot of online research because there's a ton about, you know, what happens if the power goes out, but anything else, any specifics Did you reach out to experts? Yeah. You know, most of the focus was on government reports for this one. Um, because a lot of work's been done on this. Uh, there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of testimony from CIA direct, former CIA directors. Uh, the NSA and other groups, you know, uh, the energy uh, regulators as to what would happen and how vulnerable uh, the grid is. So it's all out there um, and it's all kind of terrifying, you know, to see just how vulnerable we are on this front and how devastating it would be if the power really went out. I mean, a former CIA director said he thought that they had estimated that between two thirds and 90% of our population would die out uh, if the power was out for a year. And when you think it through, you know, the, that's probably a pretty reasonable number, probably more toward the 90%, I would think. Now, did you find yourself preparing, becoming a semi -pre prepper after researching for this book? You know, I should, I, I should be more so, uh, but I, I haven't been, I haven't been too bad about that. Again, you know, I'm lucky that I live where I live, though. Actually, I split my time and this is kind of what I was thinking is I sort of split my time between here and Granada, Spain. And, you know, if it happened when I was in Granada, I'd be dead. You know, there's, there's just nothing you could do. Um, in Wyoming, you know, I could put a fur hat on and probably do okay. I'd be a mountain man. Yeah, I, th I think the Midwest, Wyoming, it might be a place to go. Like you said, the cold, though. I just can't stand that bitter cold. <clears throat> the cold's yeah. a problem. I mean, even for the trappers back here, you read you read stories about, you know, Jim Bridger, and he almost, at one point, he almost died of thirst because all the lakes and rivers were frozen so deep, he couldn't get to the water. He'd sit there and chip at it and chip at it all day. So, <laughs> you know, you don't want to be in that situation. Now, I, you've written, in, and I've read this on your thing, and we are talking about in a pre-interview, was about a lot of books 
revolve around drugs, terrorism, and politics. And as soon as I read that, I'm like, you know what? It's true. A lot of the thrillers do revolve around that. Out of those genres, which one do you think you like writing about the most? I think probably politics uh, are kind of fun, and I think they're becoming more and more a threat to the United States. I mean, you know, for a while when I was growing up, it was the Soviets. You know, that's what all the thrillers were about. Kind of transitioned to Islamic terrorism. You know, then Russia rose up again as a threat and China. And now, you know, you had North Korea, Iran. So it, uh, it's kind of this constant flow of bad actors. And uh, unfortunately for the world, but, you know, probably fortunately for thriller writers. Yeah, I, uh, I've always been partial to the narco world just because I worked in it for a while. And I would love to see one of these like, you know, just goes across the whole thing where you have the narco traffickers supporting the terrorists who are funded by politicians. I think that's going to be my first book. It's going to hit all well, three genres. Read my last book, it's very much like that. So you, I will have, the, you know, yes. the narco terrorists in Mexico supporting a, a, a terrorist group. So, yeah, that's an interesting combination of things. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, one thing I do want to get into is your writing process. Now, uh, obviously, you know, I, I do my my 30 second research on my guests and reading that you do like these massive outlines. So when you do actually start writing that, it's a lot easier to put pen to paper. What is your your process? I mean, is there something you'd like to share with us? And especially with this post COVID where, you know, everything's electronic. I mean, were you writing? Right sketches out before and now and then you put it to paper or, or how do you work in that yeah so i do i write very very elaborate outlines and then i don't necessarily follow them so i mean the outline for my new book my new book will probably come out around a hundred thousand words and i think the outline is thirty eight thousand words so you know it's almost all there i just have to kind of fill in the prose but what I do with that is I learn the book. You know, I learn the characters, I understand the book. And then when the characters go off in different directions, or if something doesn't look good on the page that looked good on the outline, it's not too much of a problem for me because I have a really strong understanding of the universe I'm creating. Um, I don't know if that would work for a lot of people. You know, I mean, Vince Flynn, for instance, you know, he wrote the same, obviously the same thrillers in the same series that I am. And he didn't like writing outlines at all. Um, you know, I know I've talked to Brad Thor about it. Brad doesn't like them. So um, it's, it's maybe unusual. Tom Clancy didn't like them. He wrote those really long books without, you know, going into an outline. So um, I think everybody has their own process and uh, it takes a little while to find it. it. Took me a few books to figure out, you know, what was working for me and what wasn't. There, the thrilling writing is, uh, it's amazing. I love having friends that do it. I've interviewed probably a ton of the, your associates as well. And I really look forward to jumping into that, going from the nonfiction world into the thrilling writing, because, uh, there's just so much you want to get out there that it just doesn't necessarily have to be all fact based yeah. now on an, yeah, on another Personal note, uh, reading that you were an FBI brat or FBI bureau brat, which is almost like an army brat. This is going to be one of those more personal questions is because my wife's an FBI agent. She's been one for, you know, a decade and a half and we have two young children. What advice would you want to, if you could go back and tell your young self that it would help me with my kids living in that life? I, you know, I, I liked it. I, I, you know, I really, you know, it's, it's, it seems like it would be much harder than it was, but I got to be around all these amazing people, which is sort of what led me to become a thriller writer. I, you know, I've hung out with the directors of the CIA and MI6 and all these incredible operators. And, you know, as a young boy, it was pretty amazing. I, I mean, these people were all larger than life. So it was an exciting way to live. I mean, the moving, you know, if you get really trapped into the moving a lot is, can be really hard. And you had to understand that, you know, sometimes you took second, you were second fiddle, you know. Um, I remember one Christmas, my father was gone. 
because of a, of a bank robbery where they'd killed a guard. And um, my graduation dinner in London, uh, Pan Am 103 crashed during it. And uh, my father left uh, and was gone for months. So uh, you, you do have to get used to that. Yeah, I could. I I always take advice everywhere I can get it, whether it's uh, family, writing, podcasting, or anything. So I really appreciate that. Now the book Total Power is out now. Your pub day, and uh, it's going to be great. Who's doing your narration for this? On the audio book. Yes. Uh, George Goodall. Very cool. Very cool. He's I, done all fan. but one, I think, of them. Yeah, I'm a big fan of audible books because. Um, as everybody knows, it's seen the protectors, watched protectors. They know I am well backlogged on my books. So uh, I'll definitely be tuning into the Audible books. I'm going to start from the beginning and when you took over, and uh, I'm going to follow you. I really appreciate you coming on and talking about this because one of my favorite interviews is interviewing authors. So thanks a lot, Kyle. Yeah, my pleasure.